Good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are uh, in the world. I imagine most of you uh, in, in Australia and the Asia Pacific. So it's uh, 11 a.m. here and welcome to uh, an insight for Entrust data card company and uh, partner uh, for this particular virtual educational session with My Security Marketplace. And we're going to dive into encryption. What you don't understand about crypto can hurt you. Uh, we're joined by Brad Gutlick uh, there in Southern California. And Brad, I'm just waiting for my next slide to come up. I always get this wrong. Uh, Brad Butley is the Vice President of Sales, Western Region of Latin America for Insight Security. And thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Brad. Sure. Thank you, Thank you for inviting me. Um, and for the audience uh, that have come in nice and early and on time, uh, we've got the 2020 Global Encryption Trend Study, which will be linked out to you, but obviously that provides you some further, fun, uh, further reading uh, as well. Um, we're going to dive straight in. I'm going to introduce Brad. Now, Brad has obviously been around, I think once you've hit that 20 year period, Brad, uh, it becomes, okay, we've been around for a long time, but you've obviously, uh, you've taken great interest in this particular field. You've been uh, with US leading companies uh, in this role as well as a cybersecurity professional. Uh, so we take your knowledge on board uh, and look forward to this particular session. Um, hold a Bachelor of Science in Edu Electrical Engineering Technology from Bradley University uh, and obviously an award-winning writer and speaker on numerous uh, security topics. I always like when someone puts their personal uh, sort of background into their profile as well and the avid skier and a collector. You've got a 120-year-old uh, car that runs on steam so uh, you're obviously uh, cross over that technology divide uh, of time so it's yeah, nice. Uh, the high tech to the really low tech, yeah. Correct, and uh, that's what I actually like. I think you get an appreciation of, uh, of history and also technology. Um, this particular session uh, for the audience, protect your keys or don't waste your time encrypting your data. I'm gonna hand over to Brad shortly. Just before we do, we've got quite a large audience here. Uh, and what I wanted like to do, at least get a sense from the audience um, what your experience is or knowledge in this particular field. Encryption is one of those from a security professional's viewpoint. Sometimes you, you touch it, but uh, from a cybersecurity professional viewpoint, uh, you should be at least have a basic understanding. So from the audience, can we just get you to rate your understanding of encryption? I'm gonna launch this uh, uh, poll right now, and it should come up on your screen. Okay, most of you there. Okay, I'll close that and I'll share that poll. Brad, we've got a, quite a good mix here. You should see that of a mix, but I mean, I would rate myself as fair. Uh, so it looks like most of the audience is in that particular field. So hopefully uh, we'll take uh, some learnings out of this particular session and I'll hide that. And for the audience, uh, if you've got a question or an, uh, sorry, a question or you would like to, to raise a particular topic, uh, please do so by raising your hand uh, and you can ask those questions. We will do a Q and A at the end of this session uh, for Brad to answer and uh, again if you've got something question I'll, I'll be monitoring this along the way uh, and I can always interrupt Brad uh, as we go through this particular session so don't be uh, too concerned of raising your hand. Brad with that I'm going to hand over to you and this should be nice and seamless here we go over to you now. Okay so I've got I've got you I got your face out of the way so hopefully my face is still in, uh, in view here. Um, but Chris, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you to the uh, the Encipher folks in the uh, the APAC region for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, uh, I have done this presentation a number of times across the United States, and I have to be honest with you: the first time I did this presentation, um, I was I asked a question to the to the group of people attending. I said, "How many could tell me the difference between or explain the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption?" And the first time I did it, I got a response of about 4%. And this was to a group of security professionals. And I was, I was kind of a little disappointed by the fact that only 4% could answer that question. And I thought, well, maybe just the, the particular audience I was, I was delivering this, this, uh, this presentation to. And as I did it more and more throughout other parts of the country, the average turned out to be 4 or 5% every time I did the presentation. And over time, I really kind of got the feeling that a lot of people look at encryption much like this little cartoon uh, where there's all this massive amount of work uh, and then there's this little last step that says then, then the miracle occurs. I think that's a lot of how a lot of people look at the uh, encryption in general. So what I'm trying to do 
is I'm going across the country, and now I guess I'm going across the world, and trying to educate people on the important aspects of encryption and what they should really be concerned about and what they should actually have knowledge on. So again, don't feel so bad, but most security professionals cannot explain the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. In this presentation today, I am going to make sure that everybody on this call will be able to uh, go to the next cocktail party and explain the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. The other thing I found was that most of the security professionals trust without question that encryption is securing their data. They just believe once you encrypt it, it's secured. And I'm gonna blow that myth too. And the other one I'm gonna blow apart today is they believe, most security professionals do believe that if they make their perimeter more secure, it's gonna protect their data. I'm gonna show you that that is absolutely not the case. And from an executive management perspective, they do want to protect their data but they're afraid to do so. I mean, all the regulations that are coming around the world from GDPR to CCPA, I'm sure there's one in the Asia Pacific region that I don't know about, I apologize, but there's a lot of uh, regulations that are coming down that are requiring companies to encrypt the data, but they're afraid to. And I think the reason that they're afraid to do that is because of the lack of knowledge. So that's what we're hoping to do in this, this presentation is to increase your knowledge of, of encryption and what's important in encryption. But I always think one of the good ways of going about explaining something is to explain a little bit of the history of encryption. And the encryption was first used about 2000 BCE uh, by the Egyptians. So this is 4,000 years ago. This was what they called a simple substitution cipher. This is really when symmetric encryption was born. So when people talk about symmetric encryption or asymmetric encryption, as far as symmetric encryption is concerned, it's 4,000 years old. It's hard to really kind of comprehend that, but it's been around that long. And it was using a substitution cipher where a simple key was used. And now, just for an example, if you have a key that is move the alphabet three letters to the right, that is a key. Uh, in this particular case, if the letter in the alphabet was an A, you replace it with an X. If it was a B, you replace it with a Y, C, you replace it with a Z, et cetera. That would be the way you would do a substitution cipher. And everyone probably has seen the movie A Christmas Story and with Ralphie who gets the, the Ovaltine decoder ring. This is symmetric encryption. So believe it or not, you guys are all used to what this is. You've seen it before. This is symmetric encryption. And this, they used what they called a substitution cipher. Now, this is important for symmetric en encryption. The key used to encrypt the data is the same key that's used to decrypt the data. So now you know. And anyone asks what sy symmetric encryption is, that's what it is. The key used to encrypt it is the same key used to decrypt the data. And within a substitution cipher, it's easy to implement and it's easy to crack. If any of you are like Wheel of Fortune fans, you always notice that whenever when somebody asks for a vowel, they always ask for E. They asked for E specifically because it's found in 12.7% uh, of the time in the English language, followed by T and A. So if you were to give a, get a substitution cipher and replace all of the prominent letters with T's and the second most prominent letters with, with, or with E and the second most prominent with T and third most prominent with A, it wouldn't take you long to figure out what the, what the cipher is. And when you really kind of think of it, um, letters don't have to necessarily be used for substitution ciphers. Technically, Morse code is a substitution cipher. In this particular case, everybody knows what the key is, but it's a substitution cipher nonetheless. Other early forms of encryption are always, I was fascinated by. There is something called a Skytail cipher. In this particular case, the king would give his general a stick, and the king would tell the general that over time, a courier would arrive with a piece of leather, and wrapped, you have to wrap the, the leather around the stick and the message will be disclosed. But in this particular case, what was the key? Some people might say the key was the stick, but in reality, the key, the diameter of the stick is the key. If the stick were uh, smaller or larger, as they wrap that leather around the stick, the message would just start to get garbled towards the end of the stick. So how do you protect a key of this type? This is kind of what this whole protect presentation is about, is protecting a key. And we've been protecting keys for centuries. But how would you protect this key? We've all seen this image. This is the image of what was called the swagger stick. This was kind of a traditional uh, a piece that a general would walk around the battlefield with. And in probably from the, uh, probably the 400s, it was never used as an encryption device, but it was still a tradition for generals to be using it all the way probably up into the early 20th century. 
and that general would would uh, use it to you know to point to a map or point to the door, or maybe whack a lieutenant up outside the head every once in a while. But this the reason that the general always had it because he was always protecting that key. That's how important it was to protect the key. Now as time progressed, more we needed to create more complicated encryption solutions. And one of the most famous ones, obviously, is the famous Enigma machine during the World War II. Uh, this was used by the Nazis, and uh, it used a, a series of rotors and key plugouts uh, to, uh, to tell the messages. And unlike a traditional substitution cipher, if you pushed an A on the keyboard, it might light up with a different letter on the, the, um, the light board. But the next time you pushed A, it wouldn't light up the same letter. So it used what was called a substitution and a transposition cipher. And this thing was so sophisticated that from a combinations perspective, there were 1.5 times 10 to the 20th combinations. That's a lot of combinations, which is why we needed to come up with a more complicated solution to break these codes. So Alan Turing, during the war, developed what was, what was referred to as the Turing bomb. And this was arguably one of the first computers that was created, and this allowed the Allies to break the Nazis' uh, code on the Enigma machine. So what did the United States use during World War II? Uh, the United States used the Navajo language and alphabet. And there used to be an expression, since I've been in this business for you know 20 some years now, uh, probably about 20 years ago, people would use the expression security by obscurity. And they would use this because they would think that the, the more uh, complicated and the more secret an encryption solution was, the better off it was. And in this particular case, the Navajo language is definitely complicated and definitely secret. They were always only known by a small tribe of Indians in the, the United States. So, but what they did was they took a, an Indian and they put him into the field and they had an Indian that was also in the uh, back in headquarters and they would communicate with each other. But what was the key in this particular case? Now, some people might say it was the Indian, but in actual reality, it was the live Navajo Indian. And unfortunately for that Navajo Indian, uh, if he was about to get captured, the, uh, the soldiers were asked that they kind of shoot him. And if he was captured, he was asked to kill himself. Now, that's an important key. But given enough time, even that would have been cracked. So here's an interesting thing. The Rosetta Stone is probably the most important key ever discovered. Some people don't, understand, don't realize this, but the Rosetta Stone uh, materialized, was found in 1799. And prior to 1799, nobody knew what the Egyptian language said. They, you, they had all the Egyptian pyramids. They had all the, the, the tombs. They had all the, the hieroglyphics on, the, on the, um, the walls. But nobody knew what they meant. To this day, no one knows what it sounds like. No one can speak the, the Egyptian language that included the hieroglyphics. But when they found this particular tablet in 1799, they were able, they were able to decipher uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics, because this, this is the key that used Demontic in the middle and Greek at the bottom. It was the same phrase, just repeated three times. So this key was remained secret for over a thousand years. It's hard to believe, but this is probably the most important key that's ever been discovered. So how important is the key? This is what we're kind of talking about in this presentation. So let's ask Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, Back in the uh, many, many uh, years ago, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Mary Queen of Scott was plotting to kill Queen Elizabeth I. And Mary Queen of Scott had hired a bunch of assassins, uh, and she was corresponding with these assassins through coded messages. Now, Queen Elizabeth realized that, the, uh, that Mary Queen of Scott was up to something, but she didn't know exactly what. So she imprisoned Mary Queen of Scott and then went out to search for the key for those messages. And she actually ended up finding the key for those messages. And she actually summarily had Mary Queen of Scott executed in the town square. It took me a long time to do this graphic, so I hope you appreciate it. Um, so that was one important key. But now let's fast forward to the 1970s. This is when computers were getting more powerful and we needed to kind of develop some type of standard. We couldn't really kind of exist with the security by obscurity. So IBM developed something called the data encryption standard. Many of us know this as DES, or if you've heard the expression triple DES, this is the data encryption standard. But there was the age old issue of key distribution that needed to be solved. 
you know, in the days when you wanted to uh, do a substitution cipher and you wanted to tell somebody that the key is going to be the, uh, the Cleveland phone book from 1977, you'd meet them on a park bench someplace and you kind of whisper that you use the Cleveland phone book from 1977, or you'd hand them some type of message. Well, in the computer world, you couldn't do that. So this is where Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman uh, came into the uh, play. Now, if you're familiar with what they call Diffie-Hellman key exchange, this is what these guys developed. And this is when symmetric encryption key exchange was born. Now, we've all known from this presentation that symmetric encryption has been around for 4,000 years. But in reality, symmetric encryption key exchange has only been around for about 45 years. And in this particular space, AES, DES, and triple DES are common symmetric encryption algorithms. So how do you send a key to someone you've ne you'll never meet? And this is an example just to kind of show you how complicated this actual process is. So let's meet Alice and Bob. So Alice has a key that she wants to get to Bob. So Alice places that key inside a box. Alice puts her lock on the box, and then she sends that box to Bob. Bob then applies his lock to that, to that box, and then Bob sends that, that box back to Alice. Alice then takes off her lock and sends the box back to Bob. Bob then takes his lock off of the box, and then he's able to get the key. Now, this is the method by which uh, it's, you, uh, you can't intercept what is in the box while it's being transmitted. Now, unfortunately, Diffie-Hellman is not that simple. Diffie-Hellman uses things like modular arithmetic. Now, in modular arithmetic, a, an equation like 9 plus 8 equals 5. Now, the funny thing is everyone on this, in this audience understands this equation because this is mod 12. Mod 12 is exactly what's on the watch face of your, of your watch. If you don't have a digital watch, you have a watch face. It's, so if you've got, it's 9 o'clock in the morning and you've got a meeting eight hours later, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. That's mod 12. Symmetric also, encryption also uses uh, the concept of a random number. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit more, but it's very important that the seed value is a true random number. And the stronger the random number, the stronger the encryption is going to be. But really doesn't matter. You just have to remember that you have to protect that key. Once the key has been generated for, safely, you have to protect that key. Now, we're going to move from symmetric encryption to asymmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption had one major weakness. You needed to know the person with whom you're exchanging information, and both sender and receiver had to have the same key. It didn't work really well, symmetric encryption that is, if you wanted to communicate with somebody that you didn't have a formal relationship. So Whitfield Diffie of the Diffie-Hellman fame, he postulated that there was an ability to take a public key and a private key and come up with a mechanism. And Whitfield Diffie was one of those mathematicians who, like many mathematicians, could have pretty much spent the, the rest of his entire life trying to solve the mathematic problem. But he realized it was really important to the world that this problem be solved and solved quickly. So he actually released all of his information up to the point where he couldn't go any further to the world and said, here, help me figure out the rest of the story. And this is where uh, doctors Riverist, Shamir, and Adelman uh, came in. These are the guys that formed RSA. So this is when asymmetric encryption and asymmetric key exchange. Now, unlike the symmetric encryption, key, uh, key exchange was born in 1975. This is where both asymmetric encryption and asymmetric key exchange was born at the same time in 1977. So asymmetric key exchange, in this particular case, RSA, DSA, and ECC are common encryption algorithms there. Asymmetric encryption is what's known as a one-way cipher, meaning the key that's used to encrypt the data is not the same key that's used to decrypt the data. That's very important. And it's the, re the real power of this is it allows you to work with entities with whom you don't have a formal relationship. And this is what's really interesting. You've ever been in the, a case where someone says they've got a 256-bit key or somebody's got a 2048-bit key, and you wonder why there's such a disparity between the key sizes. Well, the reason is that symmetric keys can be smaller than asymmetric keys to have the same security. Or in other words, an as a symmetric key um, or an asymmetric key has to be larger. For th in this case, a 128-bit symmetric key to have the same security in the asymmetric framework has to be a 3072 asymmetric key or an AES key. 
And because of this, asymmetric is a slower encryption algorithm. Okay, so what's next? As computers get faster, encryption is going to have to keep up with it. So we've got quantum encryption. We've got photon encryption coming down the line. We've got quark encryption. And my absolute favorite is the dweezil DAC encryption. Okay, I really, want, I really made that one up. But just I wanted to make a point. In the end, it really doesn't matter. And don't believe anybody that says they can crack an AES 256-bit key. There are 1.15 times 10 to the 77th combinations of an AES 256-bit key. Now, if you remember back to the example I was showing you for the Enigma machine, that was 1.5 times 10 to the 20th. This is much, much bigger. And to give you a feel, that is the actual number of an AES 256-bit key. It's a huge number. And for those of you that are interested, this will be read as 115 quattro vigintillion. took me a while to figure out how to say that, but it's 115 quattro vigintillion. And the current time to brute force attack an AES key using an incredible amount of power, more than any nation state has, is still measured in millions of years. And, oh, don't believe anything Hollywood says in this particular case. Every one of us have seen, you know, TV shows or movies that shows a, you know, the bad guy with the gun to the head of the good guy and says, you know, decrypt this message or you die. And after feverish typing, uh, they're able to decrypt the message. Can't be done. Nothing. It, it's furthest thing from the truth. Here's the truth about modern encryption. No one in the right mind would ever, ever, ever try to break an encryption key. It can't be done. The only thing that hackers have at their disposal is to find and steal the key. And the only thing we have as technologists and people want to, to want to protect the data, the only thing we have is to protect that key and protect that key at all costs. So how can you protect the key? You have to put your key into a hardware security module or otherwise known as an HSM. This is a specific piece of hardware that's designed and certified to, to generate and protect cryptographic keys. Oh, and by the way, preferably one made by InCypher. Uh, sorry for the short commercial on this case. So in a hardened security environment without an HSM, your keys are basically everywhere. And Chris, are you still there? This is where I want you to kind of have the next poll that we had. Yep, we're so ready to go. If you're using, without an HSM, if you have, uh, you're using a cryptographic elements, uh, your keys are in your application, your operating system, hypervisor, everywhere. They're in their backups. They're all over the place. If you use an HSM, all of your keys live inside that HSM, and a hacker will not find them within those the other environments. So, Chris, launch the next poll for, for the audience, if you can. Here it comes. So, for the encryption solutions deployed within your organization, how the encryption keys stored? We put a I don't know there at the bottom just uh, prior to starting, just in case. Is it coming up on the screen, Chris? Yes, it's coming up. Uh, they're voting. Because I don't see it on my side, but that's okay. <laughs> we I'm need more people vote. Yeah, I was going to say we need more people voting because uh, we had 100% I don't know. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it comes back with 100% I don't know, it's typical. <laughs> this is really typical for companies uh, that they, they don't know where their encryption keys are. And this is kind of the important part, is you need to find out where that key, those keys are. Okay, we're getting, uh, I'll give it a couple of more seconds. I'll give it 10 more seconds. And we're getting quite a good re, uh, response here until I see this. A couple more, it's quite spread. Okay, all right, I'll share that with you. It's, uh, here it comes. So. Sharing now, so we've got uh, just under 30% in software, under 20% or 17% for in hardware, about 43% uh, using both, and about 13%, and uh, I don't know. Good. So there you go. Back to you, Brad. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the audience for that. Thank you very much for that. So this is where things are going to start to get interesting. Hopefully you found it interesting already, but this is where things get interesting. Why use an HSM in this particular case? The average time between a hacker's penetration and detection is 160 days. Now, I first learned this statistic uh, attending a seminar that was being conducted by the FBI here in the U.S. And the FBI agent was saying that the number was actually 260 days. And I thought that was ridiculously long. So I did some more research. And the two numbers, if you do the research on it, you'll come up with is 160 days or 260 days. Even at the low end, 160 days is five months worth of time. 
that's a long time for a hacker to actually be in your network trying to find things out. And the other and thing Brad, is, just sorry to interrupt, Brad, and you'll find in the Asia Pacific region, even last year, as of last year, it was about 420 days. So it is uh, on research marked uh, longer in the Asia Pacific region as well. Wow. Well, you know, then then uh, it's it's worse than I thought it was. Um, but the other thing is, in, if you're using, if you're storing your so your keys in software, you're most likely generating them in software, and software cannot generate a true random number. This is where people find it's interesting. If you've ever been, uh, if you've ever had a, a, an Apple iPod or a Shuffle or one of those things where you've been listening to, let's say, a thousand of your favorite tracks, it conceivably would play the same track twice. And it was funny. I was I was doing some work around my house this uh, this last weekend. And my system did just that first time it did it, but it played the same track twice. I was really kind of laughing at myself for that. But a hardware, a, a true HSM tests for randomness. And believe it or not, there's actually a test for randomness and you cannot get this test in software. So you have to be able to test for the, the, the random number in hardware. And most importantly, keys that are stored in software aren't hard to find. So when I've done this presentation, uh, uh, to audiences that can respond to me directly, I kind of throw up the question as to, can somebody from this data trace find the, uh, the, the, the encryption key? And they're not easy, they make it a little bigger so it's easier to find. This is where the, key, the encryption key most likely is. And if you look at it, the lack of pattern is often the sign of an encryption key. And you have to expect this because they're being generated with the random number. So if, you, if you've got a, a, a hacker that's in your system for 160 or 400 and some days, all they have to do is create a routine that says, find me randomness. And then they probably will end up finding encryption keys. So the other thing to consider is what do all these companies have in common? Yes, that's right. Every one of them has been involved in a breach. And the breach have bypassed the perimeter security measures. So I had to look into this. I had to find out what companies were spending on security for perimeter protection. And 451 Research, a very reputable research company, did a study and found out that 87% of security budgets are still being spent on perimeter security. Well, if you go back to that other slide with all those, those the perimeter breaches, I mean, why are they doing this? Why are they still spending their money on the perimeter thinking it's going to protect their data? Why? So I've been postulating this question myself, and I've really come down to the, the answer that it's in our DNA. For over 5,000 years of recorded history, we've built walls to protect assets. We've been walls, moats, barbed wire, you name it. We've done all this to protect assets. And for those thousands of years, those assets have been physical. It's really only been the last 70 years, and I'm pushing it at 70 years, that we have had to protect uh assets that aren't physical. So only 1% of recorded history has been spent in the digital age. We need to reprogram our DNA. That's what I've been trying to do with this presentation, is trying to educate people that they cannot continue to build walls around their data. They have to protect their data, and they have to protect the keys that are protecting their data. And I know it's going to take some time, but we're going to get there. So let me put it another way. If a burglar wants to break into your house, does he break the window? Probably not. If your house is anything like mine, I've got a window probably within uh, a meter of my front door. But the first thing I guarantee a burglar is going to do is he's going to check and see if the door is locked. And if the door is not, if the door is locked, he is going to try to find the key. If you take anything away from this presentation, I want you to look at this image. This is what it's like if you have encrypted your data and you've protected your, your keys in software. The hackers are going to come into your network, and they're going to start looking under the mat, and they're going to find the key. And then don't forget that a hacker has 160 days or possibly more in, in APAC to find that key. And once they're in, they have access to all your encrypted data because they now have the keys. And remember, a hacker day is not necessarily one person for eight hours. Consider the damage a group of hackers can do. A lot of times, if a nation state is involved in getting access to some of your data, if they want to uh, uh, do uh, access to your blueprints or access some of your other things, uh, they might bring one person in to penetrate into the network. And once they get in, they'll probably invite their five other friends, which would be three plus man years worth of time. 
or maybe 10 friends, six and a half man years, or maybe a nation state would be 50 friends, 32 man years of time. And this is 160 days. I can't imagine it's, you know, be four times that amount if it was at 400 and some days. And this also assumes that the hackers are working union time rules, which is probably highly unlikely. And in the real world, this is your corporate data that they're getting. So we've talked a lot about database encryption, but in reality, crypto elements are pretty much everywhere. So you've got database encryption is probably the most obvious, but you also have file encryption and you've got digital signatures. One of the things that I'm doing uh, in Latin America is they're very much advanced when it comes to digital signatures and digital certificates. There are some countries in Latin America that are actually providing a, uh, a baby a digital uh, a signature upon birth. And that's a, a particular signature that they have to protect for the life of that child once they become an adult. So you have to protect that. IoT devices. I mean, if you're developing an IoT device, let's say in the medical industry, uh, where you have uh, a pacemaker or some type of a, a measuring device, or how about these new autonomous cars? Uh, they will have, uh, they have the IoT and they're getting access to the internet. These devices have to have a digital certificate to make sure that the hacker can't access those devices. You know, anybody that's into the blockchain, uh, that's got a digital uh, key as well associated with it. And of course, digital payments. Uh, those are all protected uh, using a cryptographic element. And SSL, SSL is another one. If you're using F5, um, you're, you're using those keys. So all these keys, all these technologies use some type of cryptographic key. And every one of these technologies, that key has to be protected. So let me put some uh, names to these technologies. Uh, these are the companies that Encypher has worked with to, uh, to integrate their software with our HSM. So if, if their application requires an HSM to be created, rather than creating it, creating it in software, it makes a call to our HSM that, that the key is created in the HSM. If the key has to be stored, it's stored in the HSM. If the key is recalled for use, it's pulled from the HSM. And in every particular case, that key is being protected along the way. And I'm sure if you, keep the, if you look at this, there's a lot of uh, applications that your, prop, your companies are probably presently using. So let's review. We've got symmetric encryption. Both the sender and the receiver share the same key. This has only worked when both parties know each other. And getting to both parties to agree on the key has always been the weak link. And, but this is but this is the strongest encryption once the keys have been safely exchanged. And this is faster than asymmetric encryption. And then we've got asymmetric encryption. The key used to encrypt the data is not the same key that's used to decrypt the data. And this is used if you don't know the other part of your system. And unfortunately, it uses a longer key strength, so, it, so it's slower than, a, than symmetric encryption. Now, there have been books written about these two technologies. This one slide is probably one of the best ways of going about explaining to anybody the differences between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Now, obviously, there are, very, there are some in the weeds uh, nuances, and I didn't, I'm not gonna go into those, but from a very, very high level perspective, this is the, these are the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Now you'd be amongst the group that knows the difference between the two. So in conclusion, Corporate perimeters are too complicated and cannot be secured. I mean, there's a great story of a casino, I think it was in Reno, Nevada, where uh, they had a fish tank. It seems like casinos and fish tanks kind of go hand in hand. Well, I guess there was some guy whose job was to, to measure the temperature of the fish tank on a daily basis. And he got tired of walking up from his desk and going over to the fish tank to figure out what the temperature was. So he found that there was a company that made uh, a wireless digital thermometer for a fish tank that connected to their, their Wi-Fi network. So he connected it to their Wi-Fi network and he, from the comfort of his desk, was able to find out what the temperature of the fish tank was. Well, unfortunately, a bunch of hackers saw the same wireless digital thermometer inside the fish tank and realized from the hacker boards that that was a penetration point. And the hackers then penetrated the, corp the casino's network and were able to download, download all the high roller data uh, and it hacked. Now, do you think the person that put the thermometer into the fish tank knew that that was going to be a security breach? Do you think the person that ran the network knew that the, the thermometer is there in the first place? That's, that's my point. Corporate networks are far too complicated. And especially now, with a lot of us working from home, uh, God knows what's being introduced to corporate networks. 
So we need to focus on securing the data and verifying the authenticity of people accessing that data. That is much more important than the perimeter at this point. And we need to stop, stop relying on the walls. They are not going to protect us. Every, there's, a, there's a great, if, you, if anyone, anyone goes up to ZDNet, ZDNet has an article that they always put out uh, at the end of December. So if you go into their archives, you'll find uh, at the end of December for both 2019, all the way back to, I think, 2015, they list all of the security, the major security breaches that occurred in the previous year. And I downloaded that list and I was kind of cataloging it. And 92% of the breaches that occurred in 2019, 92% were perimeter breaches. 74% of those uh, perimeter of those breaches were raw database breaches where they actually accessed the, the hackers accessed the data. So they didn't protect the data. So we are not encrypting our data as much as we should be. We're, we're relying too much on those um, those perimeters to protect us. We need to reprogram our DNA. We are not protecting assets anymore or physical assets. We're protecting intangible assets. And the other thing is don't believe anything Hollywood tells you. Modern encryption solutions cannot be detected through hacking technologies. You cannot do it. The hacker's only option is to find or to steal that key. So we need to protect that key. And don't leave your keys at, at, under the mat at your home or at your work. Protect your keys at all costs and don't let this happen to you. So if you're not familiar with with in Cypher, a little bit of background on Cypher. And Cypher has been developing these hardware security modules for over 20 years. These things are being used by many of the corporations around the planet. Uh, and more corporations should start, should start using these for even more things other than just database protection. Anything that's cryptographic most likely should be protected uh, using an HSM. That HSM should generate the key. That HSM should also protect the key. So. Thank you very much. I hope you found this interesting. Um, I would uh, welcome any of you to, to link up with me on LinkedIn. I am, believe it or not, the only Brad Butlick on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to believe, I know, uh, but I am. So please, you know, join me on LinkedIn. I, I usually, I, I write a couple blogs every couple months or so. I'll come up with something. I just wrote one just recently that um, asked the, the kind of the provocative question, which is more important, the, the your data or the key protecting it? So I thought that that's a good one to read. So Chris, maybe, do you have a, I was going to say, we do have a couple of questions, but maybe that might be a good question to start with, uh, which is more important, uh, the key or the data? Well, in, in my world, uh, the key is much more important. Uh, typically a single key can be used to protect a lot more than a single piece of data. So there's a, um, there's an old uh, kind of ditty that uh, kind of goes up, uh, for the want of a, of a um, horseshoe nail, or the kingdom was lost. And in this particular case, I think in many cases, for the want of a encryption key, a corporation is lost. So something as simple as an encryption key can expose uh, data, and then it, it, it ruins reputation, it ruins revenue, and it could ruin a company. So all from that, from just that simple encryption key, that's the most important part to protect that. Um, we did have, I don't know if it's a, Question or a comment, but uh, apparently someone in the U.S. Uh, security agencies actually invented uh, or came up with an asymmetric scheme uh, just prior to RSA coming out with theirs. Have you heard of that? And it came out sort of subsequent to that because he, uh, the comment here was he wasn't able to put it on his resume because it was classed as top secret at the time. <laughs> from a from an encryption um, solution? Well, you know, there's yeah. been there's been there's been you know hundreds probably thousands of encryption solutions. But the issue with, with any modern encryption solution is that the, the actual encryption solution has to be publicly known. Every aspect of the encryption solution, how the key is generated, how the key is protected, has to be publicly known so that it can be publicly vetted and tested. The only part of an encryption solution that needs to be kept secret is the key. This is kind of when I went back to the, the security by obscurity uh, discussion. Uh, that was the, the uh, effort to have the, the actual process of encryption to be kept secret and the key was kept secret. So two separate things were kept secret. That's like the, 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 the Nazis Enigma machine. The machine itself was secret and the keys were secret. Yeah. Well, they found out 
how to how the secret encryption solution worked, and then all they had to do was figure out what the key was. So it's so it's not inconceivable that somebody created something before Des. I don't doubt that for a second. And there's been many encryption solutions created after it, but. I would I would avoid any encryption solution that hasn't been vetted by a bunch of very very smart uh, cryptologists. Correct. I, I think um, we've got a couple more. Yes, the slides will be available. This session is recorded, so it will be available uh, on our channel, My Security TV, as well. Um, yeah, spread the word. One other, yeah, absolutely. One other one is um, what would be the leading standards today? I mean, you mentioned AS two five six. Um, what would be some of the sort of the benchmarks if you're looking at, say, a specification or a, a standard to, to hang your hat on? Uh, right now, AES, 2, 2, AES 256 is probably uh, the present benchmark. Uh, it is, there is no computer technology that's out there yet that's, that is going to crack it in any conceivable lifetime. Um, now, that's not to say that there are people that are trying to come up with quantum computers. And then the issue of whether or not AES 256 bit is going to be strong enough will come into play. Um, but the nice thing about encryption uh, algorithms and AES specifically is we can just increase the size of the key, which also incre increases the size of the complexity. Um, I'm not too concerned uh, from a cryptographic perspective that quantum computer is going to make secrets obsolete. I am concerned, though, when quantum computing does come up, that some of the data that was encrypted, let's say, five or 10 years ago, using a key strength that is not worthy of the current technology will be forgotten about, and somebody will find it, and quantum computing will allow them to decrypt it. So it's, I'm more concerned with, with older, older data that was encrypted using uh, lesser keys. Um, that's, that's what kind of concerns me uh, into the quantum age. Okay, I'm just trying to read the other one. Uh, hang on a second. Um, maybe, could you just, while I'm just trying to get this question down, um, just briefly on photon uh, encryption uh, and what you see there. Photon, photon encryption is, you know, at this point, I think it's mostly theoretical. Uh, and I'm sure somebody has actually tested and worked it out, but it has to do with uh, light going through uh, uh, certain elements at the photonic level. Uh, so it's bringing its, the, the encryption down to a very, very itty bitty uh, uh, perspective using light. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's gonna end up being used, uh, but it's, you know, there's a lot of people that, and it all has to do with the, the quantum computing race that everybody's on. Uh, if you've right. noticed, there's, there, is, there are companies right now that are coming up with quantum random number generators. Uh, yeah. Much like to my, my earlier part of my presentation, where I talked about how important it was to have the most random number possible. And I do believe that before we really start seeing quantum computing, we're going to start seeing uh, quantum, random, quantum random numbers uh, appearing in systems. Yep, I'm starting to hear that too. Um, it's a slightly obscure question, Kate, but how can banks protect themselves is the question. How can banks protect themselves? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it's it's I think banks banks actually do a fairly decent job from a protection let's say credit card transactions. If you ever notice that that any of the computer hacks that have occurred with a credit card transaction the 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 hack typically doesn't occur uh during the transaction itself. It occurs when the data is being stored for future use or for past record. So what banks have to start doing and they have to start doing it more is to encrypt the data that's in their databases. And all the database vendors, whether it's SQL or Oracle or whomever, they have relationships with companies like ours and they do encryption on their own. Uh, so like SQL, for example, you can actually turn SQL database encryption on. Uh, you also can work with an NC and Cypher HSM to protect the key within a SQL database encryption solution. So what banks need to start looking at is all the data that they have and starting to encrypt all the data. I was just recently uh, the victim of a database breach with one of my banking institutions. They, they're, they're, it's always great when you get that email from them saying, I'm sorry, we've been, we've, you've been involved in the database breach. So, and I, I asked them, it's like, well, aren't they encrypting their data? And they said, yes, we're encrypting our backups. 
<laughs> so none of my live data was being encrypted, but my ba the backups were getting encrypted. I don't know what good that di that did them, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to convince them that they need to start encrypting other parts of the data. But I think this goes back to the the issue that that lots of companies are still relying on the perimeter security. I mean, I challenge people that, that you know the next time they go to one of those conferences, uh, security conferences, uh, the old days we actually walk around and you see all the booths, is to stop. At any point, look around and look at up, look up the big marquees that are that you can see wherever you are. And I guarantee you that the majority of the companies whose marquees you'll see are perimeter security companies. Yeah. Oh, endpoints as well. Yeah. They're still getting the lion's share of the uh, of the security budgets, and yep. people have to realize that they, they the, the perimeter is important. Yes, but they cannot just simply rely on it. They have to assume. They have to actually develop a posture that assumes that a hacker will get in. It's not a matter of when, it's will. They'll, they'll, they'll get in sooner or later. Um, one more here. I note AWS was not on the partner wheel, unless they were. Uh, do they use software key storage? AWS, um, I think they they were either on the partner wheel or under a different name. Uh, AD, uh, with uh, Amazon Web Services, you can encrypt data in software. You can encrypt data in hardware that they are, that that AWS provides, or you can actually encrypt the data on premise in a hardware security module that you have at your corporation, or you can encrypt or you can have the keys stored in a private cloud. So we have relationships with AWS for basically three of those four uh, situations. Um, I've got one here. Uh... HSM, what is the difference between, is it payment HSM from Talos and data encryption HSM and Cypher? The, I guess the, 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 I have to kind of go back a little bit. At one point in time, and Cypher was part of the Talos organization. So when we were part of Talos organization, Talos had two separate HSM uh, product lines. One was a payment HSM and one was what we could refer to as a general purpose HSM. Uh, in Cypher spun off, or Talos spun off in Cypher, uh, and therefore the general purpose HSM into a separate company. Uh, so Talos maintains the payment HSM, and in Cypher has the general purpose HSM. And the difference is uh, between a general purpose HSM and a payment HSM is kind of like the difference between a lump of clay that you can mold to whatever you want, which would be the general purpose HSM, or a sculpture that already has its form. Uh, and that's what I call the payment HSM. The payment HSM is specifically designed to handle payments and payments only. So it won't right. handle, you know, not, it won't, you would never use a payment HSM to let's say do a PKI or to do a database encryption uh, you or to do SSL. You'd use a payment HSM to protect payments, hence its name. So the, in, the Encypher product is what they call a general purpose HSM and can be molded for all these other uh, addition, additional use cases. Is that okay, maybe I think so. And there was a couple of others on the HSM as well. I think uh, if you're diving into that field, I think maybe contact Brad directly. I've got one more here. Let me read it first. Um, wouldn't you say that new tech in Auth is also a key priority? Auth is also a current weakness. Wouldn't you say that new tech in authentication is also a key priority? Uh, that is, authentication is also a current weakness. Yes, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, it does. And that's where digital certificates and digital uh, um, signatures come into play. Uh, that is the authentication part of it. So if you have a, um, a smart card um, with a chip on it, uh, inside that chip is a uh, digital certificate. Uh, that's the authentication piece. Uh, so uh, that needs to be like any other cryptographic element. It needs to be generated appropriately to maintain the security of it appropriately. Uh, so, and you can only do that when you're using an HSM. Great. Well, look, I think um, on that note, I think there was definitely interest there from the audience. Um, I'd like to run a poll with the audience if we can, just before we finish, just to get a sense of uh, how your understanding has improved. I know mine has. Let me just launch this. If you could just answer this uh, last poll for us. Um, on has this uh, assisted your understanding of encryption? Um, I'm one of those that uh, just has to do more and more uh, of these sessions on encryption. I learn it, feel like I've understood it, and then 
six months later, I, <laughs> I should be doing a new session. Um, and look, thank you very much for the audience there. That's really good feedback uh, coming through. Um, I'll give it uh, three, two, one, uh, and there you go. Uh, we had, uh, let me just share that. So majority said yes very much and yes. Uh, and then we had uh, a couple of couple of people there saying nope, had a good handle on that, and uh, that's that's very good. But I think a majority there uh, took a good session out of that. Thank you very much for that. Good, Brad. I'm going to take back control and just finish off. Thank you very much for the audience. Sorry if uh, we didn't address your questions. There's a few more coming through uh, and comments. Um, look, thank you very much, Brad. I do appreciate that. That was a very uh, insightful session from Encipher, uh, and uh, I do appreciate that. And hopefully, we'll have uh, have you back as well. Thanks also to the Encipher team uh, for organising this and partnering with us uh, on this particular session. Um, and we will have this session available on My Security TV on our YouTube channel. Uh, where we have the full suite of the virtual educational series uh, and they're there as part of a sort of a growing library. You mentioned uh, the importance of the perimeter. Our last session was on endpoint security. So this is a nice follow on uh, from that. And, uh, and in hindsight, maybe we should have done encryption first and then start talking about the uh, the perimeter and endpoints. Um, so Brad Bushlick, uh, thank you very much there from Southern California, the Vice President uh, for the Western region. Uh, and Latin America. Thank you very much for joining us in the Asia Pacific region. Happy to happy to attend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to our audience for attending. See you next time.